I've literally. Oh, it's all right. Yes, carry on. We're live. <laughs> no, I didn't um, mean right at the second, but we can do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because this this is a talk that's that's actually hosted by Bioabundance. Um, is 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 my understanding. And um, yourself um, and um, David Rogers have kindly agreed to, to host this, this talk and explain exactly, as you see it, the situation in terms of the, the development that we are faced with um, in terms of the Oxcam arc. Um, just normal people living out there are assuming that everything's basically been halted, but we know now, because I've seen the first talk, um, that that is not so. So so hence my request that we have another talk this evening um, to um, spread the word, really. Um, this is so important that we all know. And so I appreciate that this is being recorded so that we can spread this far and wide. So over to you, Sue and David. Thank you. Um, well, I'm one of the directors of Bioabundance Community Interest Company. Ian Ashley is the other. We set it up um, to promote the abundance of nature in Oxfordshire. And our, one of our first um, things that we had to tackle was uh, overdevelopment in South Oxfordshire, uh, which I shall explain as we go along now. So 30 years ago, an Oxfordshire village in the Chilterns set up what they believed to be the very first toad crossing traffic sign. Every year, locals would take their buckets and fill them up, bucket load after bucket load, with migrating toads and help them safely across the road. How many buckets do they need today? 100? 10? No, not one. The toads have vanished. Roll back 10 years before the toad crossing sign and I was studying wild rabbits for my Oxford University doctorate. I chose rabbits because they were plentiful and easy to watch. Not so now. Now they are on the red list for endangered species. The size of the catastrophic decline in nature depends on your starting point. This watch list indicator shows an 80% drop in the size of key species populations from 1970 to 2010. But go back to an earlier starting point and the decline would be even greater. Why does this even matter? What has nature ever done for us? What has it done, aside from providing clean air, clean water, flood control, the breaking down of waste, local climate control, shade, and tranquility of mind? Well, there is food. There are the pollinators. We are so close to losing our insects. Without pollinators, there would be no fruit and very few vegetables. We would have the wind pollinated grains. There would be bread, but man cannot live by bread alone. Losing the insects, a vital element of our ecosystem, would be like taking out the crucial supporting block from a Jenga tower. The whole edifice would collapse, which would be fatal to us. We must work fast and furiously to recover nature. But by how much? The UK government talks variously of no net loss, a better state, or even 10% gain, but against which depleted baseline? Oxfordshire, of all the counties in the southeast outside London, has the worst access for people to wild spaces. It's a poor baseline. Would 10% gain on the rubble of a soil denuded chalk hill be adequate? Nothing will come of nothing. And 10% of nothing is nothing. The goal should not be relative to the current state of nature. 
It should be an absolute. Bioabundance Community Interest Company has set a goal for us to restore nature to its best state since 1950, when the so-called greening revolution started to pour chemicals on our land. Meanwhile, there is a destructive rush to build upon our land for financial gain. Once land has been concreted over, it cannot be restored for nature or used for regenerative farming. Each new town or road bisects a landscape where previously wildlife could flow. Creatures are forced into smaller and smaller islands. As the islands become too small, the new tiny populations become unviable and are quickly extinguished. In South Oxfordshire, there is a plan to build 32,000 homes. That's all of these between 2011 and 2035. That's a 50% increase in housing over what we had. And yet over this period, the Office for National Statistics projects that a mere 8,000 homes will form. So four dwellings are to be built for each one that can become a home. And necessarily, 24,000 newly empty homes will be created. It need not be the new homes that lie empty. It might be the chocolate, chocolate box Chilton villages that empty out. They're bought up by the global wealthy, a second, third, fourth homes, or left empty as money, money boxes. Two years ago, I became part of the new Green Lib Dem administration at South Oxfordshire District Council. We were elected in by local people to overthrow this hated overdevelopment plan, which had been put together by the previous Conservative administration. But instead, we found ourselves in a merry-go-round with the Conservative government and were forced to take the plan through to adoption. The plan is an affront to democracy and to climate change action. And on these grounds, bioabundance is challenging the process. The High Court has said our grounds are insuffic insufficient and so we are taking the case to the Court of Appeal. The plan will see terrible climate effects and increased collapse of nature whilst producing homes that do not solve the housing crisis. Crucially, development plans are supposed to mitigate climate change. But government's idea of what mitigation means appears to differ from that of the IPCC. Mitigation of climate change should mean reducing greenhouse gases. Government takes it to mean increasing greenhouse gases by not so, but by not so much as you might otherwise have done. There are many actors in the drive for profit from development with landowners at the forefront. As custodians of our land, they have a responsibility to bring back a safe natural world and help us reach zero carbon. And yet Oxford University colleges who own so much and who once took this responsibility seriously are now amongst the most rapacious of developers. If you have influence with any colleges or other landowners, then please help us. All this is not to minimize the acute housing affordability crisis, but the simplistic demand supply model does not apply in a near infinite market. House prices do not come down with more houses built. This huge development of flats at Battersea Power Station was under construction down the road from where my son lived in a vermin infested damp basement shared with other professionals. I suggested he look at buying a studio flat there, but the prices started at an eye-watering 1.3 million. Even if on another planet where he could have afforded this, he would not have got a look in. The first tranche of 1500 flats were sold overnight via Singapore. They were not advertised in England. 
house prices could be stabilised by restricting the buying of homes to those who live in the area, as in New Zealand, India and Vancouver. Or homes could be sold only for res residential purposes, as in St Ives, Cornwall, reducing the second home ownership problem that prices locals out of their right to shelter. But that would not serve GDP growth. Where does it all end? The South Oxfordshire local plan was spawned from the Oxfordshire Strategic Housing Market Assessment of 2014, which prescribed the building of 100,000 homes for Oxfordshire for the 20 years up to 2031. Well in excess of need, said Dominic Raab, the then housing minister. And there it stops. Unfortunately, no. I served for a year on the Oxfordshire 2050 plan making group. By boring people to death, I managed to swerve the vision toward one of nature first, a beautiful green vision. The same has been created for the Oxford, Oxford Cambridge Arc. A million houses are to be built between Oxford and Cambridge by 2050. A tiny fraction of that number would house the growing population there. What the industrialization of the area may do is create the Silicon Valley dream of its proponents, a government dream channeled through the local enterprise partnerships. But what it cannot do is restore nature and zero our carbon emissions. At this point, I'm usually asked three questions. Why would developers build homes they cannot sell? There is an insatiable, almost infinite international market for homes unrelated to local need. Developers can sell homes even if they are to remain empty. Secondly, if, there, if this is too many homes, they will not be built. So what is the problem? And now let me tell you a secret concerning a very little understood aspect of planning law. Local councils set a target number of homes that must be built, about a thousand a year in the case of South Oxfordshire. If they do not come on stream at the pace required, developers can insist on being allocated yet more land for development. This five-year housing land supply rule is misunderstood to mean that insufficient land has been allocated. It is in fact about the housing supply. If the council cannot prove that developers have spades in the ground going forward for five years to meet the housing targets, perhaps because the market has slowed, then you, the people, are punished by seeing yet more land go to housing. It's a win-win for developers, a lose-lose for you, the citizen, and for us on this earth. South Oxfordshire, with its new high target in place, teeters on the edge of a return to the wild west of speculative land grabs. This is just one of the abominations in that developer's charter, the National pa Planning Policy Framework, or NPPF, with which the, the Conservatives replaced decades of planning law and precedent. But it is still not weak enough for those seizing our land. A new planning bill is to replace even this Mickey Mouse document and to take the lid off all controls. The third question is, won't the homes be filled with people coming from London? It must be understood that all parts of our country are being told to build houses far in excess of need. Government wants 300,000 new houses every year in England, but only half that number of households is likely to form. Necessarily, for every two new dwellings built, one new empty home is created. So yes, people might come from London, but then who will fill the emptying out homes there? And what are the global heating implications of all this building? 100 tonnes of CO2 are released just during the construction of the average home and its share of supporting facilities. 
as developers have prevented zero carbon homes from being mandated as they were to have been in 2016, we still have homes being built that will ooze out five tons of CO2 per annum for their whole lives. These add to the 27 million homes that need eco-fitting to reduce carbon emissions, insulating and renewables. And there is no plan for how this will be done. We should be building the number of homes we need. Uh, someone's got their, um, someone's not muted. Could everybody mute themselves, please? Including the um, blackbird. Oh, no, it's wood pigeon, sorry. We should be building the number of homes we need, not the number of homes the market can absorb. We should always plan first for nature. Uh, we really do need that muted. Could everybody mute themselves, please? Tina, are you meet, muted? I, you. I can mute people from here, so oh, oh, I have just realized I've under control. <laughs> yep, I think we should be, okay. We should be building the number of homes we need, not the number of homes the market can absorb. We should always plan first for nature, which is fragile and essential. Professor Lawton's 2010 government report, Making Space for Nature, makes it clear that before anything, we must plan for the restoration of nature at a landscape scale. The focus in Britain now is on protecting nature through natural capital accounting. Monetizing the value of nature is good and bad. Does it make us protect nature or exploit its value for financial gain? Where Professor Lawton said that swathes of land should be restored for nature with no strings attached, the consultation on the Environment Bill principles, which concluded today, emphasizes that nature rest restoration will happen only where it makes money for investors or in order to make up for nature you destroy elsewhere, so-called offsetting. In Oxfordshire, we are setting up a statutory body, a local nature partnership. Sounds good, I thought so. But on the board, only one or two seats will go to nature groups. The rest are for businesses and development interests. Local nature partnerships all along the Oxford Cambridge Arc will manage the offsetting from its industrialization. The million unneeded houses will destroy nature and the offsetting money will be paid to make up for this elsewhere. But let us not kid ourselves. Nature cannot be moved. The best way to restore it is not to trash it in the first place. The value of nature will not protect it. It is worth three billion pounds across the arc, set against a starting value for the housing of 200 billion. How can we ensure that government does not allow natural capital accounting to asset strip our countryside? How can we ensure that it takes responsibility for the restoration of swathes of land for nature and does not leave it to the ineffective, invisible hand of a distorted housing market. And it is distorted. Bob, Bob Colnut, former planner, calls it the house building finance complex. Cornwall loking, locals call it house farming. The financialization of housing is problematic. 80% of lending is for housing, and our casino capitalism depends on this single asset class. Will the financialization of our natural world similarly mess up efforts at its recovery? Cambridge is well ahead of Oxfordshire. The direct exploitation of nature is already underway. Investors have rushed in to convert meadows where, water meadows where cows once grazed into a municipal park with plastic cows. Financiers are particularly keen on nature areas maintained by volunteers, which will be more profitable. 
What is actually needed is the protection, extension and enrichment of existing natural landscapes. Bioabundance is proposing a new regional park northeast of Oxford. There's Oxford, that's the regional park. Um, incorporating Otmore yeah. and the ancient yeah. forest yeah. of Burnwood yeah. and Stonewood. Now that government has scrapped the idea of the expressway, an unneeded motorway between Oxford and Cambridge, the park could be extended northwards to the Upper Ray wetland and the Brill Hills. Oxford City Council is in favour of considering such a park. Can you help us with getting this regional park for our county? Bioabundance is an extensive group of ecologists, planners, lawyers, and enthusiasts for nature. We would welcome you at www.bioabundance.org.uk. Thanks. Um, we, thank you for the little clap, Tony. Um, <laughs> um, let, let's, let's go straight on to what David has to say. David Rogers is a uh, retired ecologist and he is, um, the secretary of the Not the Expressway group, which is called something else now, David. Yes, it is, Sue. I'll mention that in the talk. Um, thank you very much, Sue. Thank you for everybody for coming. I'd like to tell you a bit about the Oxcom Art Plans as they currently stand, and I want to concentrate on the housing threat, which is very serious still, and on the idea of saving nature, which has been associated with the Art Plans or making the art green. I want to show you that the idea of net gain is actually a dangerous delusion. We will lose nature, we can't save it. Uh, mostly in the past, we've developed simply by concreting over nature. We've built uh, roads, which are not just to speed up the journey from A to B, but actually they're to open up the countryside for housing development, as you can see in this slide here. The difference of the Oxcom Arc is that in the process of this sort of development, they're proposing to save nature. Now, how are they going to do it? Let's look first of all at the area that we're talking about. The Oxcom Arc is now defined as the five ceremonial counties you can see here, Oxfordshire to Cambridgeshire. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see the total number of houses, people, and the total area of the five uh, ceremonial counties. Now, Oxcom Arc plans intend to add one million houses to that total. So that's a 66% increase and uh, more than a million people, that's a 51% increase. This is a huge increase in the houses and population in a relatively small area, about 8% of England, about 5% of the UK. It's a huge development project. The particular dimensions of that development project were defined in 2018 in this Partnering for Prosperity document that comes from the National Infrastructure Commission, the NIC. And the headlines are shown there, they're fairly straightforward. Uh, the bottom line, 163 billion increase, is really what it's all about. We're doing all of points one to four there in order to achieve the 163 billion increase. And Michelle, right at the start of this talk, said, well, since we've cancelled the expressway, which is point two there, does that mean that the whole project is shelved? By no means it doesn't. In fact, the whole thing is going on full steam ahead and they're finding alternative ways to connect Oxford with Milton Keynes, which was the job of the expressway. So effectively, we've got almost an expressway by another name. Uh, first of all, I want to look at the proposed distribution of those million houses to see how it might impact uh, Oxfordshire and the other counties. This is a slightly earlier map of the Oxcam area, and I'm outlining the ceremonial county of Oxfordshire here, and the other counties, they're not quite the ceremonial counties, I've called them North Ants, Bucks and Beds in Cambridgeshire. And the million houses were distributed by Savills in these pie charts. And the total of all the houses and all the pie charts adds up to the one million, that is the target. So if you look at just Oxfordshire, that pie chart has three different colored sections. The pink section is for currently planned homes. Uh, Savills reckoned it was 60k in Oxfordshire. In fact, of course, it's 100k in the Oxfordshire growth deal. The dark blue segments are for London commuter homes. And finally, the brick red ones are for the additional 
houses that the Oxcam plans or the Oxcam Ark would unlock, very often by drilling roads through green countryside and building houses along them. And the blue segments amount to about 23% of those million homes. So our five counties would become the dormitory counties for a quarter of all those new houses. In the yellow splashes here, we've got the increase in houses proposed under these plans compared with the current housing stock. So in Oxfordshire's case, we're going to more than double our existing housing stock. It's an increase of 105%. In Cambridgeshire, it's 81%. And on the bottom right here, you've got the Office of National Statistics prediction of the increase in household numbers in the UK to the same date, 2050. So you need to compare what the average UK figure will be, 16%, with the much greater figures proposed for the ARC, between four and more than six times the projected national increase, the average increase. And looked at on the UK scale, of course, the map here is the entire UK, including Northern Ireland, and the ARC counties are in the pale blue at the bottom here. Now, the Office of National Statistics predicts that by 2050, there will be 16% more households and that will require about 3 million more houses across the entire length and breadth of the white areas here. But 1 million of those, 1 million of the 3 million, will go into the ark. Why should a third of all new houses go into less than 1 20th of the UK's land area? It's a massive overdevelopment project and it's uncertain that the natural environment can cope with this level of overdevelopment. Now associated with the Oxcam Ark scheme is the promise to double nature, to make the Ark the green Ark. And the Ark Universities Group, the nine universities across the Ark, are joining together in the schemes to double nature to ensure net gain to make this a green Ark so that nature is saved as we build a million houses. This is not going to happen, and I'd like to explain why. But you, you've got a couple of documents here. One is from the RSPB, Nature's Ark, be a part of it. We were invited about a year or so ago. And more or less at the same time, the Wildlife Trust launched something called the 100 Miles Wilder Scheme, which include three steps to building uh, greenery into the proposed art plans. And then Natural Cambridgeshire came up with the idea of doubling nature. And you can see the quote there from the Natural Cambridgeshire Scheme. As Sue pointed out, of course, if you haven't got much nature to start with, it's quite easy to double. Uh, a, a rather small amount. And Cambridgeshire has got the least coverage of wood, natural woodland of any county in England. So it'd be quite easy to double Cambridge's woodland cover. But the idea of doubling nature from natural Cambridgeshire was eventually adopted by the Arc Universities Group, which are in charge of all the ecological developments associated with the Arc plans. And this is one of a couple of documents that group has produced. There's a quote there from Councillor Bridget Smith, who's essentially the ARC czar or ARC czarina for these greening ARC plans. And if you ask uh, Councillor Smith what to mean by doubling nature, she's pretty honest about it. She says, well, I haven't got a clue what doubling nature means, and I don't have a clue how to do it. But I've got some very clever people help me to do it. That, quite frankly, is a slightly alarming statement because, as Sue pointed out, the environment is actually our life support system. Why should we be worried? Well, as Sue indicated, the Environmental Bill, which has just come back to Parliament from the House of Lords, it includes the requirement for all new developments to ensure 10% net environmental gain. And we're going to look at the uh, dubious claims for net environmental gain and how, in fact, it means a net loss of wildlife areas, despite what everybody is saying about it, including, alarmingly, the wildlife trusts. So let's have a look at how DEFRA explains uh, net environmental gain. We've got three scenarios here. Let's look at scenario A, first of all, the simplest of all. We start off with a field with trees in it. A developer comes along and builds houses. Now, if there's sufficient uh, space left on the building site to put two trees, then effectively we've got net environmental gain on site. This is called on-site offsetting. What I forgot to say is that the developers are obliged to go through a four-step process of which offsetting is the last step. So first of all, they must avoid harm. Second, they've got to mitigate it. Second, uh, thirdly, enhance the site. And if all of that fails, then they have to do off-site offsetting. 
So scenario A is the easiest one. Scenario B, we start off with a field, in this case with four trees, we build houses on it, but you can only uh, allow two trees to grow. So the developer has to pay for compensatory habitat creation somewhere else, off-site offsetting. And that's the thing on the right here with some trees and some rivers and some reeds around it. This I think is a much more common scenario than scenario A. And the final scenario is when, for example, as in scenario B, but the developer cannot find sufficient close by sites for offsetting. So he or she pay, pays a tariff and that tariff is used for offsetting somewhere else in the country or maybe even somewhere abroad. Now, of course, the dangerous scenario you see is that all the local people see all the pain of development, this here, and they see none of the gain of offsetting because it's occurred tens or hundreds of miles away. But that is the principle uh, in, embedded in the environmental bill. There must be net environmental gain. And for the ox come out development, if there is no development at all, there will be no funds for nature. There are definitely no, no strings attached funds, the sort of funds that John Lawton asked for in, in making space for nature. The developer's quite clear about this. If you don't let us develop, we're not going to fund nature recovery or doubling nature. Now you can liken biodiversity offsetting effectively to taking Westminster Abbey, a wonderful, beautiful structure like our natural ecosystems, turning that into a pile of stones and putting that on an offset site somewhere else and saying it's the same thing. Of course, it's not the same thing. It won't be the same thing for several hundred years in the case of uh, ancient woodland, by which time, of course, all the species dependent on that woodland have completely disappeared. And by the way, HS2 have done exactly this when they've knocked down ancient woodland along the track of HS2. They've taken sapling trees from that woodland, they planted them on the offset site, and they said, we are moving ancient woodlands. I mean, that's an insult to the intelligence of a 10 year old, quite frankly. I want to explain why, in fact, net gain actually is actual loss, because net gain is all about yields and actual loss is all about stocks. And this is explained very clearly in the Dasgupta review and the work from the Bennett Institute, which in fact parallels Dasgupta's recent review. So let's think about yields and stocks. And the simplest example is to think of a fishery, because a fishery, there's a stock of fish in the sea. That stock every year grows by some fish lay eggs and some of the fish die. And we come along with our trawlers and we take a yield from that stock. And each year we take a yield. But if we overexploit the stock, we work it too hard. You can see that stock at the bottom is beginning to diminish. And as the years go by, the stock gets lower and lower because we're working the stock too hard. We're trying to take more and more effectively out of less and less. And the final situation here is basically the stock collapses and we have no yield to take. I try to apply that idea of yield and stock to the 10% gain in terrestrial ecosystems. And we do that here. We've got a stock, we've got two fields, one field, one on the left, field two on the right. They're identical before development gets going. And we've got in each field a certain number of biodiversity units, 100 units. This is according to DEFRA's biodiversity metric, which we can talk about later on if you like. Two identical fields. What happens is the developer comes along and buys up field one and decides to build on it. So the first thing that happens, of course, the environment gets dug up, the concrete gets laid, the houses are built. So clearly, if houses cover this entire field one, off-site offsetting is required. So the various conservation charities, NGOs and so on, come along, they offer their services to the developer. And as a result of their services, they generate or create 110 units on the offset site. So originally the offset site had 100 units, but they've got uh, net gain on that offset site through their conservation activities. And in token now, we've got 210 biodiversity units on a site that originally had 100. We have achieved what the environment bill requires. We've got 110% yield, so we've got 10% net gain. The environmental bill is satisfied. But look to see what in fact we've happened, because we've halved the stock. We're getting half the stock to do more than twice the work of the existing stock. And the field on the left 
is no longer available for nature. And that's the, uh, that's the Achilles heel of all these attempts at net gain. We are going to work less and less stock, harder and harder to achieve our biodiversity gain, our capital flows, and our life support systems. So our setting is a certain destruction of habitats in one place with the uncertain hope of reconstructing elsewhere, and it always involves the certain loss of stock. Now, the UK hasn't got much experience of offsetting, but globally, there's quite a lot of experience. Let's see what the result is. Uh, in Europe, they've been practicing it for more than 40 years. And as you can see, a substantial proportion have failed to deliver net gain. In Australia, they've been doing also for quite a long time. Some studies have shown that on the offset site, it would take more than 140 years to achieve net gain on the offset sites. And this is the limited UK experience. We've had some uh, retrospective uh, project, uh, pilot studies, and you can see that there was a shortage of expertise or suitable offset sites, or importantly, an unwillingness of developers to pay for the full impacts of their development. These are all problems ahead. Very recently, the um, Institute, the Dice Institute in the University of Kent have carried out a survey of all examples of offsetting they could find in the literature. They found almost 16,000 articles, but in fact, very few studies from which they could see whether or not um, gain was achieved in those studies. And in fact, it wasn't gain at all. It was no net loss, so neither loss nor gain. The studies covered 300,000 hectares of offset sites, about 2% of the global offset area. So it's actually quite a respectable sample size. What were the results? In, and look at the histograms here. In only about a third of the examples was no net loss achieved. Not net gain, just no net loss. And in two thirds of the site in brown and the various colors of form there, uh, either it wasn't achieved or they couldn't be certain of the outcome. This is a shocking, a shocking success record for something which the Oxcam ARC plans have basically bet their farm on. And Dieter Helm, who's the chair of the Natural Capital Committee, says no one has yet achieved net environmental gain at scale. And of course, the five Oxcam ARC candles are definitely an attempt to achieve gain at rather a large scale. So remembering that the net gain chance of success from the DICE Institute studies was about 33%, let me ask you a question. If you had a loved one who was going in for a major operation where the chance of survival was about one in three, would you be happy with that? Because that's exactly what the Oxcam ARC plans are involved in now. A one in three chance of success, and as we saw, it really isn't success. It involves a loss of stock. Why should we be worried? Well, here's an advert that came out very recently from Bebout. And it's an advert for a managing director of a future nature WTC, which is a wildlife trust consultancy. It's actually a new adventure for BBAT. It's a business arm. And that business arm is offering the BBAT expertise with knowledge of legislation, species habitats, et cetera, et cetera, and knowledge of the planning system. BBAT and the other wildlife charities are getting lined up to offer their services for offsetting uh, not just, of course, across the arc, but for all development across the country, which will be the requirement of the Environment Bill. And if you look at the application pack for this job, should you be interested in the BBAP job, we've got this requirement here. Well, you've got to know something about biodiversity net gain, and you've got to have knowledge of the development planning regime, a new planning white paper, the Environment Bill and so on, and the application of biodiversity net gain principles and DEFRA's biodiversity metric. This is the wildlife trusts not exactly selling their soul to the devil, but I think walking completely unawares into the trap of greenwashing. In fact, this is probably a view of what the wildlife trusts are getting themselves into. At the top, you've got all the people pulling the strings. You've got governments and ministries and departments on the left there, and you've got all the development agencies, including Oxford and Cambridge colleges, and these are just a few of very, very many, uh, pulling the strings. And the question is, can the wildlife trusts really resist the power of the lobbying of these groups 
pulling their strings. Thank you very much. We started off life as the No Expressway Group and managed to achieve the Expressway being cancelled. We've now got to change our name. So our new name is Stop the Arc, and we'd be very grateful if you join us in the future. We haven't actually got a new Gmail address yet, or indeed a new URL yet. We're working on that. So if you want to contact us, please use the old contact details, which are here. Thank you very much. Oh, that was great, David. That was absolutely horrifying. I had no idea that that the, that automatically you you halve the amount of stock or lo lose the stock. It was really, really shocking. And again, now you've explained it to us, a, a 10 year old can see through that. Yeah. So how on earth? And so I, mean, I have to say the same argument applies to natural capital, because when you talk about natural capital, the natural capital of the arc has been calculated about three billion. That's the goods and services, the natural environment across the arc. It is actually an annual yield because when you challenge the natural capital experts, they say, look, we can work out the yield, we can work out the environmental services that uh, a woodland or, or, or grassland does for us, but we can't actually work out the value of the stock. They work out the yields, they have no idea of the value of the stock. Yeah, yeah. And so they're prepared to trash the stock. So we, we've talked a lot now, fellas. Is, is anybody, would anybody like to speak? And you'll need to unmute folks to, to ask questions. Please do. Yeah. Or put your hand up and I can unmute. <laughs> Laura, okay. Yeah, no, thank you. That was so illuminating. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. I just want to, to tell you that we're going to do as much as we can. People who are concerned by these issues, within the university to make people more aware of, of this because there is a lot of ignorance. As you know, the university has just um, prepared its new strategy, uh, sustainability strategy, which is very much based on the principles you've just outlined to us. Um, and there is a lot of ignorance among everybody about that. So there is a lot of um, pedagogical work to do there so people understand what is going on. And we can make sure that uh, the environmental sustainability, the desire of so many people at the university to actually increase biodiversity through the land that the university and the colleges are responsible for um, can be done um, under other principles. Um, and I think that, as I told Sue uh, not long ago, farming is going to be an important issue in that as well, given that a lot of the land controlled by the colleges is farmland, and that a lot of farmland around Oxford is going to be sold because of the changes uh, linked to Brexit, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the economics of free trade with Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So we need also to think about how we can increase biodiversity with a different kind of farming. If we do not do this, um, for Oxfordshire in particular, which is a very, there is a lot of farmland around here. I think it will be a problem, but thank you very much. Thank you. I was interested to David in, in what you um, what you said about HS2 and taking out an ancient forest and then planting mm. some saplings. Mm. Something on a very small scale has happened locally in, in uh, just outside Wallingford, where were on an edge where the developers felt that they were going to be able to build um, a house right next to our bypass. Five mature trees were taken down without planning permission, without whatever it is. Well, it turns out we didn't know, but what you need is a forestry commission license to do something like that. Mm -hmm. So it has been found to be illegal and the uh, developers are going to be hugely punished by having to plant five little saplings mm -hmm. in place of these trees. Now, what my husband's just suggested was, is that you should, you should find a way of valuing the stock so they might have to build 500, grow, plant, 500 or maybe 5,000 trees to make up for that 
huge stock loss that they have created and find the land in which to do it. And then you've got a proper disincentive for people to misbehave. And that's just in the misbehaving stakes, but that, that should be how we, st should that be? Is that a way? It, is, will, would there be a way of doing what we need to achieve? Well, I mean, I think you, you've certainly got to have, um, it, it, you've, got, you've got to make sure developers do not break the law. So you've got to have fines and very severe fines. I mean, the water companies are very good at breaking their laws on sewage disposal, for example. I mean, the other example of, of damage that HS2 is doing, there's the um, many hundred years old, the Huntingham Oak, which was in fact the tree of the year, not so many years ago. And HS2 simply chopped it down, not for the track of HS2, but for a road to access the track of HS2. I mean, for heaven's sake, you can build a road around a tree, uh, but that was destroyed. So I think the other trouble with planting trees, so as you know, is um, when, when we plant a tree to offset our carbon, it takes 50 to 100 years for a tree to accumulate one tonne of carbon. That is way beyond the 2050 limit where we should actually get to net zero carbon. Of course, the other thing is that many of these planted trees, they're not looked after, so they don't grow, they die. Mm. You have to maintain the saplings before they get established um, and can look after themselves. Um, Patrick's got his hand up. Patrick, do you want to unmute? Yes, um, uh, thank you, David. I'm really enjoying listening to this. I, I, my uh, webcam is, is playing up, which is why I haven't got it on. I'm from Maids Morton. I don't know if some of you might have seen our documentary that we produced um, about this this fight against the development. But I just wanted to come in on, on the tree thing. I mean, I, I'm a forester by profession and I find it absolutely outrageous the way that developers treat trees with no penalty and uh, Really, it's, it, it would be quite simple. Um, all you need to do is to say, if you take down a mature tree, you have to replace it with a mature tree, which costs hundreds and hundreds of pounds, mm -hmm. and you put a £10,000 fine on everyone, and if you build up enough points, you're banned from developing land in the county. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a question of persuading governments that this is something they need to do. To, to, to respond to but we have what the political scientists call capture i mean basically as in the finance sector you have the development system which is essentially being captured by the developer so the people who are making the rules are advised by those who are supposed to abide by them and it's just gone all the way through i mean i live in buckinghamshire and our council is appalling. I mean, from what I've heard, Oxfordshire is not much better. We do have a lot of land around here owned by Oxford colleges, but essentially the council planning people are only interested in meeting the target. If anybody wants to build houses, they are welcomed with open arms. Local communities are ignored and um, that's why we finish up with what we've got. And as was said earlier, developers are not playing by the same rules. They're interested in selling houses and making profits. So they don't build the houses we need. They build the ones that make the big profits. And there's no penalty and there's no control. And uh, I find it awful. And uh, the sad thing to me, having worked around the world for many years, is that local communities in this country are treated worse than those in the developing world. <laughs> so I'll stop, I'll get off my hobby horse, but yeah. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Patrick, very much. Yeah. Um, Tony. Hi, yes, a couple of points. The easy one first. Um, the increase in biodiversity should really actually start at the home first. Um, we've got a 800 square meter plot with our house on it. I think we planted 10 trees on it and there were trees there already. There isn't a inch of lawn anywhere. I don't mow. We've got plants everywhere, nectar everywhere. But I only have to literally look at neighbors' houses and everything is mowed to within an inch of its life. There's no real planting, no structural planting. 
and I can go further down um, the hill at Garsington, and it's barren. And it's a matter of education of the yeah. people, first of all, of um, actually to improve their own landscape. Yeah. The second point, and, and this may sort of go against the your gist, I totally agree about the biodiversity, etc. I'm all for it, and I'm hope doing it myself. The problem we are faced as a world is that energy is changing. In I think 10 or 15 years, we won't have a gas boiler. So what will we have? We'll have houses heated by electricity. And the problem with heating by electricity, whether it comes from wind power into some sort of heat pump or from a air source heat pump, is that the buildings have got to be highly efficient, not only for insulation, but for air leakage, etc, etc. It means that all the Victorian stock of building, which is loads of it, nine inch wheel walls, which are solid, will need at least eight inches of insulation to even get it to what would be the L London's um, 20% increase on the old building rigs, and that is now. 15 years in the future, those Victorian stock will have to be something like a foot of insulation. I have no idea where you're going to put it. You can't wrap it around the outside of the houses because they're physically not fair to be able to do. You've got to change all the windows to triple glazing, so again, there's all energy involved in that. You've got to seal them up. And whereas the new build, if, they, if various um, local authorities adopt the London way of um, for development and plan permission, where you've got to be at now 20% greater than the 2008-2013 building regs, we, we've got to build new houses because the old stock just isn't there to be able to heat with the limited resources we have got to heat. So that's the, the side for the, in a way, the development of new houses because we've got to develop new houses because they're super insulated, less energy is used in heating them for another hundred years time. But what it does mean is, and it won't happen of course, is that all the Victorian stock should be taken down and planted as um, parkland. Yeah. But that won't happen of course. <laughs> That, that's a very good idea. Uh, and actually, we have a, a pioneering builder in um, Oxfordshire, Ian Pritchett, who um, um, has a company called Green Core Construction. Uh, and he builds uh, not zero carbon, but zero, but, but negative carbon houses uh, that actually absorb, you know, arguably, it's better for him to build them for him not to build them because it pulls in the carbon if we were not to worry too much about the biodiversity angle. And, and yes, he would have us pull down all that stock. But if you think about it, we've got to have good societies. We've got to have good places for people to live. And those places that have grown up organically over hundreds of years, like, like Oxfordshire, like Wallingford where I live, everything is set around in a proper manner. You've got the shops and the, and the pubs and the eating houses and things and, and the community halls that all exist. Now, unfortunately, since the developers are interested only in money, it's very rare. I don't think I've ever seen a pub in any of these new estates. Um, and, and they won't do uh, community halls and things like that unless they're forced to. I don't believe they're creating proper communities, these places. And what they are doing is disturbing where wildlife is established. And, and you know what we were talking about earlier is that where wildlife is established is your ancient forests and your... your, your um, your successful chalk meadows, of which we have so very, very few left now, um, it, you wouldn't be able to pull down those Victorian houses and get... I, I worked in retrofit for, for a long time, so um, I, I know exactly what you're saying. There, there may be, I'm beginning to think there may be a way around it with the air source heat pumps, you know, get a dual version, which has a second heat pump, so it helps you out with these houses that shouldn't be being heated by an air source heat pump, because as you say, they're meant to be very well insulated. Or, or we just get on with the insulation. 
and that's, that's a whole another story. Yes, but as I pointed out, insulating Victorian terrace houses you're going to lose all the, the footprint of the house because the amount of insulation you need to even bring it to current standards. There, there are modern ways, there's, there's modern... Uh, I'm, an architect, I'm an architect, so I do know the modern ways. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, 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 well versed in them. Tony, I mean, th there's a triple whammy coming down the tracks for developers. The first is the new building regulations, which should have better insulation standards on all new They buildings. will do, coming out next year. The second is that bit of the planning white paper that talks about the um, building beautiful homes, the sort of pattern book idea, which defines the window reveals of not all new buildings. This will make all new houses more expensive. And the third is the requirement for net gain of all new development. Now, those are three triple whammy. It's a triple whammy which will make all new houses more expensive. For the developers to build. Mm. And we know how they managed to escape from producing the quantity required of affordable houses at the moment. They're going to find all sorts of ways to wriggle out of these three new requirements when they come down the track. And um, as you say, we should be building better insulated houses now. We shouldn't wait for three or four years for the regulations to kick in. And the Goldsmith Street example in Norwich is a, is a wonderful case. You'll build, they built social houses, 80 of them, Passive house, so less than zero carbon houses, they were less than 100, £150,000 each for a 100 square metre dwelling. We can do this, and they were built at about 80 per hectare. We, we can build to modern standards, it's just that the major house builders aren't doing so. That's true. Well, no, absolutely agree. Therefore, um, what I'm in a way saying is the push should be into, into really pushing improved standards and get it more out there in the public. The public, to be honest, I don't think give a toss. Don't give a monkey about it. No, this is what government does. Now, if the government has all these regulations and it's nodding towards zero carbon and better quality houses and net gain to the environment, it should enforce all of these regulations legally. And we know with affordable houses, developers just run rings around planning departments and don't provide even a percentage of affordable housing that agreed in local plans. I no, I've seen, I've seen it myself. They are not affordable, of course, in a place like this. <laughs> uh, the answer is to build social houses. I mean, it, we need a great big push to build social houses, insulated social houses, and that would solve so many different problems all at once. Is that before the Conservatives come back in and then sell them all up again? <laughs> well, Ian. Um, Ian. You need to unmute. Thanks. Yeah. I, I thought that was excellent, both of you. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, I've got a question, David, for you, because I, I, I think you did an absolutely fabulous job, your team on the No Expressway Group, and I was mm -hmm. delighted when you um, decided to uh, continue this uh, this <laughs> struggle. So, you know, yeah. it was just remarkable, I think, from two to three years of setup, and there you were outside number 10, and, and you made a major contribution to... Mm -hmm. Um, stopping that expressway. So, I, so my question is, what's what's the plan then? So, so are you going to share? Is now a good time for you to share how you think we might, uh, or how you're going to? So, I'd encourage everybody to join you first yeah, of all. Thank, thank but then, it's how how would you? How do you see the activities over the next year to um, stop this well, uh, this arc now? Um, first of all, the plans aren't. The, the plans aren't formulated at all, Ian. I mean, there was the spatial framework document that came out in February. It didn't say a, a, a dicky word about actual the spatial arrangement of new towns or roads across the arc. So there's a, a two year period from now until about uh, two years time, by which time they will have produced a detailed spatial plan where the new town should go, where the uh, multimodal transport system should go. And our, our attack here is, first of all, you're aware that in the local elections, of course, we targeted councillors who were sitting on the ARC leadership group, and we actually got rid of four of them. And four out of the seven we targeted are no longer in the ARC leadership group, and two of them lost their seats. The Mayor of Cambridge and uh, the Chair of Oxfordshire County Council, Ian Hudsford. So that shows that uh, members of the general public can be effective. Uh, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of uh, lobbying, uh, and um, if we can get uh, many people writing to their MPs or local councils, we can succeed. Um, sorry, uh, the roundabout answer to your question is that what we're trying to do 
is we're adopting a pincer movement. It's top down and bottom up. So the top down is that we're going to tackle various politicians, not just across the arc, but challenge the various assumptions of the arc and a number of other webinars I've given has shown that in fact, the economic benefits of the arc are far, far less than the government's claiming. Most of that 163 billion isn't due to some magic agglomeration effect. It's simply due to the assumption that you've got more workers coming in and each worker is more productive. Now you could do that anywhere else in the country. You could put more, more workers anywhere else. Uh, you could assume that they doubled their economic output in the next 30 years, because that's the assumption. And you could have that growth anywhere in the country. So top down, we're challenging the politicians to say, look, this is a, a fantastic level of overdevelopment. And then bottom up, we're trying to reach all the parishes across the five counties, emailing them, getting articles in their local parish magazines, uh, and try to connect up people to really challenge their local politicians. Because Ian, you're aware that there's not been a single public meeting anywhere across the arc of any ministry or local authority with any members of the public to date. This is a scandalous, it's a sort of a vacuum of democracy. Nothing moves faster than a bandwagon in a vacuum. And the Ox Come Arc plan is definitely a bandwagon and it's operating in a vacuum of democracy. So we, we are feeling our way. We're trying to find the um, pinch points, the lever points that a small group like ours can make a big difference. And um, because the plans are so badly thought out and because the plans are so intrinsically bad anyway, we hope the government will see sense. The other thing I want to add right at the end, Ian, is that the um, Kerslake report, which was something called the UK 27 Commission, was looking at how the UK should develop. And it started out by observing the UK is one of the most unequal countries in Europe, in the world, in fact. We've got the richest city, London. We've got something like four of the six poorest regions in the European community. And what Kerslake said is, look, the problem in England is we've been developing the Southeast far too much. In fact, the Southeast is the net contributor to UK Treasury. Everywhere else in the country does not make a net contribution to the UK Treasury. And Kerslake said, if you would continue to invest in the Southeast, you won't solve the Southeast problems because congestion will get worse, house prices won't come down, as Sue indicated, and um, the system will simply grind to halt. So the Southeast doesn't win by investing in the Southeast. The North continues to decline because there's no investment in the North. This is a lose-lose situation. Business as usual is lose-lose, Kerslake says. If, he says, we invest in the North, so we push some of the developed money that was going to come to the south into the north. The north obviously benefits, the north develops, the north develops the green industries of the future. The north definitely wins, but actually the south wins as well, because in the south you've got fewer new jobs. So house building can just about keep up with the increase in the jobs. Congestion doesn't get worse, so the south wins as well. So you can go from a lose-lose situation, which increases inequality, to a win-win situation which decreases inequality across the entire nation. And if this government is serious about decreasing inequality, read Kersley. It's a, it's a fantastic report because it identifies so many obvious problems uh, in, in one document that the government just seems to ignore. Okay, thank you. Question. And would you agree, David, that the outcome that we should like to see now that we have a new Oxfordshire County Council would be for Oxfordshire to withdraw from the ARC? Is that good? Would that be yes. acceptable? Yes, it should. Um, it should do what Bucks did, which is withdraw from the ARC leaders group, Sue. Um, and you're aware that when Bucks withdrew from the ARC leaders group, it did it on the grounds that Buckinghamshire wanted to define its own future. It didn't want its future to be dictated by Cambridgeshire or the Penlands or anywhere else. Uh, so a very smart move. And um, this would not cost Oxfordshire or Cambridgeshire very much because it's a token gesture, quite frankly, withdrawing from the art leadership group. But it sends a very strong message to government that they don't have the counties quite so lined up as they thought they once did. So if we could persuade our new councillors, and after all, we're saying, look, you should put your votes, you, you should put your policies where your votes were, because we overturned both Oxfordshire's council to a Lib Dem Green Labour Alliance and Cambridge's council 
to the similar Lib Dem, Green and uh, Labour uh, alliance. Um, if they're serious about their voters, they should each withdraw from the ARC leadership group. And if you take off both ends of the ARC, then essentially the middle will collapse. Good. It will be a good first step. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Right, um, that's 7.05. So I think we'll call it a day um, now, chat. Sam wanted to speak, I think. Sam's got oh, to Hello, can I just ask a quick question, really? Um, sorry to keep you all. Um, I was very interested, um, David, in your, the calculations of natural capital is something I've been very cynical about for a while mm. and your sense of the stock, et cetera. And, um, I'm, I'm a councillor at South Oxfordshire, but I'm also a parish councillor and I'm also the chair of the Climate and Ecological mm -hmm. Emergencies Committee on South Oxfordshire. So I'm, I'm, what I'm thinking now is, and following on from Sue's point about withdrawing from the ARC, you know, I'd like to be in a position to set, almost set the scene before we withdraw from the ARC, if we, if we do, mm -hmm. by using um, some calculations, some motions, putting them to council, maybe some getting some papers written, where mm. the sort of things you said in your talk mm. can sort of be more publicised, be more public <coughs> and therefore come into council policy. I'd also be interested, at, you know, just on a parish level to put a motion forward saying, we think the ARC is a load of rubbish, you know, in a very specific way and we don't agree with it. So I'm just thinking about the sort of those steps and how I, in my capacity as a sort of, you know, counsellor mm. on lots of levels, can sort of set that scene because I feel that the, the argument for the art needs undermining first before you can just, I think we've got a very good chance of sort of, um, sort of disputing the arc, if you like, and pulling out of it and saying, you know, now with the new councils, et cetera. But I do feel that we need to do it really clearly on some some very specific evidential basis. Yes, uh, yes I mean, look, we'd certainly be happy with it. We're, one of the things we're trying to produce is a very short document uh, that will go to councillors, giving the reasons why they should withdraw from the ARC. And we'd love to work with you on, on that. And um, uh, I think Sue advised us that it's rather pointless to write to councillors because they have 200 emails a day and they don't really read them all. And I sympathise with them. Um, but if we have councillors like Sue and yourself on the inside who are prepared to basically buttonhole your fellow councillors and talk yeah. about this thing, and I'd be very happy to come and give talks to the council, if you like, about just how dreadful the art plans are. I mean, can I just add, Sam, that uh, Oxfordshire is struggling to deliver the 100,000 houses under the Oxfordshire Growth Guild of 2031. That is a walk in the park compared to what happens after 2031, because according to the ARC plans, Oxfordshire then has to, de to deliver 200,000 more to 2050. Yeah. And uh, all the documents say that everybody will have to build houses at twice the current rate to meet the million house target across the ARC by 2050. It's a mm. dreadful, scandalous, wasteful rate of development. It will ruin the countryside of the five counties. Yeah. So no, yes, I, I mean, Sue, Sue I can put us in touch. Yeah. Um, That'd be great. That'd yeah, be great. Please. Thank you. I'd like yeah. that. Very good. Okay, fellows. See you again. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you very much, so everybody. Much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye.